and welcome everyone. I am Juan Carlos Gamarra, Ambassador of Peru to the United Kingdom. And I'm very pleased to announce the launch of the Embassy YouTube channel, in which we will be presenting valuable information about Peru, including events, talks, and other artistic expressions that I am sure will be of your interest. These productions are given thanks to the collaboration of top-level specialists, cultural and academic institutions, and ULATIN TV productions. In this opportunity, I'm glad to present a series of sessions on the World Heritage Sites located in Peru. We have divided our 12 heritage sites into six podcasts in which we will welcome specialists to talk about these exceptional places and their meaning for humanity. And to start off, today we are connected with Dr. Luis Enrique Lopez Hurtado, coordinator of the cultural section at the UNESCO office in Peru. Luis Enrique is an archeologist graduated from the Catholic University of Peru and has a master's degree and a PhD in anthropology from, from the University of Pittsburgh. As a teacher and researcher, he has published a series of works on the process of the creation and expansion of the Inca empire and on religious syncretism during the first decades of the colonial period. First, Luis Enrique will explain what it means to have cultural expressions considered world heritage sites. And afterwards, he will talk to us about one of the most important sites that exist in Peru, Machu Picchu. So thank you very much, Luis Enrique. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me please congratulate and recognize this very important initiative of the Peruvian Embassy in the United Kingdom. Before talking to Machu Picchu, I would like to make a little introduction about what to be part of the World Heritage List means. The World Heritage List originates in the 1972 UNESCO Convention for the Protection, Preservation and Promotion of World Heritage and uh, Cultural Heritage and Natural Heritage around the world. However, among this great and varied body of heritage properties around the world, there are certain ones that, according to the convention, have universal outstanding value. That means that their testimony, this heritage property, communicates, if of essence, to understand the very nature of humankind. And the other side of the same coin is that every loss or damage to any of these sites results also in an invaluable loss for the whole humanity. In the Latin American region, Peru has one of the biggest number of world heritage properties inscribed under the 1972 convention. Peru has 12 of these properties recognized, uh, recognized as world heritage, a number only matched by Mexico in the region. And if we consider that, we notice that there are profound similarities between Mexico and Peru in terms of cultural heritage. Both have a millenary historic debt of complex societies of civilization, and both have a great variety of cultural expressions. Putting these two factors together, that explain why so many heritage properties in these two countries have been declared as uh, world heritage by UNESCO. Also, also, what it means for Peru. Peru not only has uh, archaeological sites inscribed in the World Heritage List, it has also historic centers, or uh, we can also refer to them as urban historic landscape, uh, the city of Lima, the city of Arequipa, and of course, the city of Cusco, a very varied number of archaeological sites that array from the sacred city of Caral, one of the in northern Peru, one of the one of the 
earliest expression of monumental constructions in Peru, around 4,000 years old. And also we have uh, other, other properties like the biggest mud, mud built city in the world, like Chanchang, the capital of the Chimu Empire. So as we can see, and least the, the, the property that was the recent property inscribed, the Capacñan of Andean road system. Declared in, in 2014, it covers 30,000 kilometers of roads, all originated in Cusco, the capital of the Inca Empire, that covers 30,000 kilometers and six countries. This is the biggest heritage property declared on the history of the convention. Thank you very much. That's very interesting, Dr. Lopez Hurtado. Perhaps you could uh, tell us something about Machu Picchu. Sure. Um, the convention was uh, approved by state parties on 1972. A little bit more than 10 years later, and Peru ratified it, I think, in 78. Then, on 1983, Peru inscribed its first two heritage properties in the list. In the, list. the Center Historic of Cusco and the Historic Sanctuary of Machu Picchu. Both a great testimony of the richness of Peruvian pre-Columbian history. In the specific case of Machu Picchu, we're talking about a, a world-renowned site, totally deserving of the universal standing, uh, uni, uni, universal outstanding value that UNESCO re requires for, uh, for a site to be declared. Before going into the history of Machu Picchu, let me tell you what were the criteria that the World Heritage Committee, composed of 21 countries that have signed the convention, found in Machu Picchu to be declared, to be recognized as a World Heritage Site. First, to be an outstanding testimony of the geniality of humankind in the way they adapt and transform the landscape. The second one, the second criteria, was to be an outstanding testimony of history, of Andean history. We are not only talking about the Incas, we're talking the history of the whole Andean region. And the third one, because of the aesthetics, of the, of the aesthetics value of the construction and the way it integrates with the landscape. Those were the two main criteria that the committee found to argue for the inclusion of Machu Picchu. Now going to the, his, to the history of this um, truly, truly impressive archeological site in Peru. As we know, the Inca Empire started in Cusco. And the first area of influence of this empire was what we call the sacred, the sacred valley near Cusco. In the particular case of Machu Picchu, Machu Picchu is located in a strategic uh, location on the way towards the Andean region and the upper Amazonian region. You know, the Andean slope has a western side that covers all the uh, Pacific Basin, and an eastern side that covers all the Amazonian Basin. Machu Picchu is halfway between one or the other, which, make it, which makes it very suitable for uh, transportation, not only of resources, but also of people. And when people move, knowledge and culture move with them. So that contributes to the enrichment of culture, the enrichment of any civilization. Every civilization of the world 
was enriched by contact of people from different parts with their knowledges, their beliefs, their tradition, their innovations, and their culture. Machu Picchu, we believe, was founded by the first history in historic Inca, Empire, Inca emperor, Pachacutec, which is also what, who we believe was the responsible for the expansion of the empire. However, there were certain political conditions inside the Inca empire that explains the particularities of Machu Picchu. One of the uh, most important pillars of Inca political establishment was ancestor veneration. The belief that a dead emperor should keep its political power, its richness, and its uh, retailers. Every imperial house that we call in Quechua panacas, that are imperial royal houses, were entitled to, at the end of their, of their emperor, be the ones in charge of taking care of the mummy, you know, that, that symbolizes the power of the, of the former emperor, and all their properties. However, this situation was an important source of political instability in the Inca Empire, because it means that the new emperor, once he step into power, it needs to, be, to make a fortune for himself, for his imperial house. And for some scholars, this was the reason behind this hundred years compulsive expansion spree of the Inca Empire. Because you as an emperor, you take the power, you have the right, you have the name, but the fortune was kept with your predecessor and the royal house, which can be potentially also um, political rivals, you know? We're talking about high level politics in a very sophisticated society, you know? So what causes it that the new emperor needed to go out, conquer more lands, make a fortune of himself. In this process, Pachacutec founded Machu Picchu to be his royal state, an emblematic side that states his power, his richness, and the power of richness of his royal house, his panaca. That's why no um, how can I say, no expense of resources, time and energy were saved for the construction of Machu Picchu. It's basically all the power of the Inca state devoted to build the site in honor to Pachacutec Emperor and knowing that, that, that this site, this royal state will be kept in the hands of his um, royal house, of his panaca. That's why in Machu Picchu, we have an urban setting that was not heavily populated. Actually, the biggest amount of population in Machu Picchu were uh, specialists removed from their original communities to serve there. So we have master handcrafts, brought from northern from the northern of the empire very skilled um well the, the parallel i found are agronomic uh, agrarian engineers brought from all the regions of the central highlands in order to have the best of the best in this royal state and in order to make this statement of luxury and religious and political power Let's take into consideration that one of the components in Machu Picchu are also of religion, religious nature. nature. You know, the Inca Empire was also uh, understood as a living divinity. And it's such, it has a privileged contact with their main uh, deities. However, what happened after the death of Pachacutec with Machu Picchu? Of course, Machu Picchu was kept into the hands of the royal house, but not with the same access to this vast array of resources, hand labor, etc. And 
following emperors, taking, uh, operating in this ideology of ancestor veneration, we're building their own royal states in the Sacred Valley, you know, like Pisac or Ollantaytambo. And that's why by the moment of the arrival of the Spaniards, Machu Picchu was not in the spotlight. And that was the reason why we were able to now visit it almost in pristine conditions. Then, then, uh, we need to understand, once again, that one of the main reasons to be able to understand Machu Picchu is in this political context of the Inca Empire, in which one of the pillars was, as I said, uh, ancestral veneration and this system of split inheritance, in which the emperor, of course, uh, the new emperor steps into power but needs to make a fortune on himself and one of the statements they made was this um, lavish uh, royal states like Pisac, Ollantaytambo and in our case Machu Picchu. That's really fascinating, thank you very very much. Um, I was thinking that perhaps um, we should we should have another session to talk more about because it's, it's so rich uh, you can you can really go into so much detail and there's so much more uh, I'm sure there there is to say I really appreciate your collaboration your help with with the embassy in this in this talk. Thank you very say, much. Hope, Thank I you very much. What was a really pressure for me to share this and please count on the UNESCO Lima office for any, any uh, help support you will need to this very, very interesting initiative you have. Thank you very much and we'll be in touch. Okay, bye-bye and please stay safe. Thank you very much, you too, bye-bye.